welcome to the latest installment in my Fall of Anne Boleyn series. Um, you might want to catch up by watching the previous few before you watch this, so go and do that now. But if you've already watched them, then you can carry on. Um, I'm Claire Ridgway, I'm the author of this book, The Fall of Anne Boleyn, A Countdown, which goes into far more detail than I'm doing in these videos. These sort of give you a taster and hopefully just um, reinforce just how quickly Anne Boleyn fell in 1536. The events happened very rapidly on a day-by-day -day basis. Right, on this day in 1536, um, 29th of April, Queen Anne Boleyn had two encounters, encounters with male courtiers, a court musician and a man who was one of her husband's best friends and groom of the stool. So let me, before I go into the encounters, let me tell you a little about these men. First of all, we have Mark Smeaton. Now he was a groom of the Privy Chamber, a court musician, and a man who is described in the contemporary records, i.e. the records from that time, as wholly supported and clothed by the king. So the king financially supported this young man. He was of humble origins, lowly status, and actually rather than being known as Smeaton uh, in court, he's referred to as Mark all the time when his name comes up. And that suggests that he was low in status and also possibly young, younger than the other men as well. But very little else is known about him. Then we have Sir Henry Norris. As I said, he was one of the king's best friends. He was groom of the stool. Sorry, the dog's just having a shake. His office as groom of the stool made him uh, very powerful because that position it controlled access to the king's private chambers and often people would make petitions to the groom of the stool to then pass on to the king. So it's a very, very powerful position. It was also a very um, intimate position, groom of the stool, because you were looking after the king at his most intimate uh, moments. So a position of power and influence. Now, Norris's son, who was also named Henry, another Henry Norris, was being educated along with Queen Anne Boleyn's nephew and ward, Henry Carey, and this had been arranged by Queen Anne Boleyn. She'd uh, got Nicholas Bourbon, who was a French reformist scholar, who she'd help actually escape from France, persecution in France. She'd got him as tutor for her nephew and had allowed Henry Norris's son to benefit too. And this suggests that Henry Norris shared Anne Boleyn's reformed faith. Norris was also courting one of Anne Boleyn's ladies, her cousin Madge Shelton, so he was often in Anne Boleyn's uh, royal apartments. Just had a dog come and join me. Now, according to Mrs Stoner, who was one of the ladies that had been chosen to attend Anne Boleyn in her final days in the Tower, one of the ladies that was chosen to report back to Lady Kingston on everything that Anne said so that Lady Kingston could tell her husband, Sir William Kingston, who would then pass it on to Cromwell. According to her, Anne told her that she spoke to court musician Mark Smeaton on the 29th of April when she found him standing in the round window of her presence chamber. He obviously looked a bit sad and sulky and Anne asked him why he was looking so sad and he replied that it was no matter. Now, his sulkiness and this rather short, abrupt answer to, you know, Anne Boleyn was queen, and that's quite a kind of snappish, short answer. That appears to have annoyed Queen Anne Boleyn, for she rebuked him, reminding him of his lowly status and saying, you may not look to have me speak to you as I should do to a nobleman, because ye be an inferior person. So she was putting him in his place. She wasn't happy with his snappish response. He replied to her, no, no, a look sufficeth me and thus fare you well. 
Now, 18th century historian John Stripe wonders if it was Anne's treatment of Smeaton on this day, um, her sort of rep reprimand rebuke, um, the way she treated him there, that led to Smeaton wanting to, as Stripe says, take this opportunity to humble her and revenge himself by making a false confession. Now, whatever the truth of that, or however Smeaton felt, Smeaton was apprehended the next day and he was actually taken to the home of Thomas Cromwell and interrogated there rather than being taken directly to the tower he was taken to Cromwell's private home and interrogated there and there he was interrogated for many hours and within 24 hours he had confessed to sleeping with Queen Anne Boleyn on three separate occasions. So that's Mark Smeaton, the encounter with Mark Smeaton. Anne Boleyn's second encounter seems to have been sort of courtly love going a little bit wrong, going a bit too far. Anne Boleyn accosted Sir Henry Norris, the king's friend and groom of the stool, and asked him why he was taking so long in actually marrying her cousin Madge Shelton. And when he gave a rather non-committal answer, she either rebuked him, it could be seen as a rebuke, or it could be seen as teasing, and said to him, you look for dead men's shoes, for if aught came to the king but good, you would look to have me. So she was suggesting that Norris was putting off marrying Mad Shelton because he wanted her, the Queen, instead. Now this was probably a reprimand, sort of trying to put him in his place and telling him to get on with, you know, marrying Madge. Or it could be seen as sort of harmless, courtly love teasing. After all, male courtiers were supposed to sort of fawn over and woo the Queen. She was, she was meant to be the object of desire, the object of their courtly love. She was supposed to be the perfect woman. And so everyone was meant to be in love with the Queen. But unfortunately, in mentioning dead men's shoes and looking to have me, she was mentioning the king's death. And that was, that was reckless words in when, you know, t thinking about the king's death could be twisted to be treason. She'd gone too far. And a horrified Norris, realising this, replied that if he should have any such thought, he would his head were off. Anne realised then what she'd said and perhaps feared that it could be twisted by her enemies. So at that point she, she ordered Norris <coughs> sorry, to go to her almoner and swear an oath about her character, to just sort that out so that um, her almoner could uh, say, you know, um, that they weren't really you know, she hadn't done something that was wrong and treasonous and this needed sorting out. So this was, this was reckless, reckless words, courtly love, teasing, flirting, which was expected by the Queen and male courtiers, but gone too far. But it was certainly not at all evidence that Sir Henry Norris and Queen Anne Boleyn were having any kind of affair or that they were plotting to kill King Henry VIII. I don't see how that, how you can twist it into that. But what I do find interesting is this date and these words, this conversation, these reckless words, are not actually mentioned in the indictments that were later drawn up, the indictments of charges against the men and Queen Anne Boleyn. I just find that a little bit odd. Anyway, that was this day in 1536, the uh, 29th of April 1536, and these two encounters that Anne Boleyn had with two male courtiers, two male courtiers who would, of course, lose their lives uh, on the scaffold because of their links with Queen Anne Boleyn. I'll see you tomorrow, but you can subscribe to this channel by clicking around about there, hit the bell to be notified of new videos, but I'll be here with you doing these until, of course, the culmination of all this, the execution of Queen Anne Boleyn on the 19th of May. Bye-bye, see you tomorrow.